I should like to call your attention this evening to that incident recorded in the book of the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 4 and the first 12 verses. The 12 verses that we read at the beginning out of this fourth chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And I want in particular tonight to direct attention to verses 8, 9, and 10. Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent men, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you. Oh. Now, it's important, obviously, that we should bear in mind the context uh, to this statement. And those who worship here regularly will remember immediately what it is. Let me remind you all of what it is. We are told in the previous chapter of a remarkable incident that took place at Jerusalem. Two men called apostles of the name of Peter and John were going up one afternoon into the temple to pray at the hour of prayer. As they did so, they were going in at the beautiful gate of the temple. They passed a man who was seated there on the pavement. A lame man, a man who had been born lame, he'd never walked in his life, and his friends and relatives used to carry him every day and put him there to sit on the pavement to ask alms of the people who went into the temple. He was just a poor beggar, reduced to that. The world could do nothing for him, so he, they just put him there, and there he put out his cap and people dropped in coins on their way into the temple. He saw Peter and John, and he asked alms of them. But something happened. Peter, looking upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said those immortal words, Silver and gold are thy none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he extended his hand to him, took him up by his right hand, and immediately we are told of this man that his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And you remember the result was that a great crowd gathered. Whenever a thing like that happens, you always get a crowd. They came rushing to see what had taken place, and they looked at the men. They knew him so well, and here he is, walking, leaping, praising God, a man who'd never walked in his life. And they looked at these men who'd done this. And as he saw them looking at the men and at himself and John, Peter began to preach to them. And in that previous chapter from verse 12 to the end, we are given an account of Peter's sermon, and we've been considering it together here for some six or seven Sunday evenings. Now then, we come tonight to the sequel to all that. Peter preached to them. He explained to them what had happened. But the effect of that was the thing that is described here, at least the effect of that preaching and the miracle and all that was involved on the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees was that they arrested Peter and John and put them on trial. And that's what we have in these 12 verses, an account of how they came to do that and what they did to them and what they said and what Peter said to them in reply. Now, what is this? Well, here we have an account of the first persecution that was ever endured by the Christian church. And uh, the persecution arose because these authorities rejected the message, rejected the gospel. Now, this is a most important matter, obviously. It's very important merely as history. 
It's the first persecution. And that gives it this tremendous importance. Because, as I want to try to show you, it has all the characteristics of every subsequent persecution. And that is why it still speaks to us tonight. Persecution always arises as the result of unbelief. What we've really got here is a rejection of the gospel. Unbelief. And in this story, in this account, we are given the great characteristics always of unbelief. Now, I'm calling attention to this, of course, for this reason. That it is precisely what we have recorded here that accounts for the unbelief that is so characteristic of this present time. You see, you and I tonight are doing something that is quite exceptional in this country. Let's remind ourselves of the figures again. Only 10% of the people of this country even claim to be Christian at all. And we are told that only half of those attend a place of worship with any kind of regularity. So we are doing something that only about 5% of the people of this country do. Why are the others, the 95% outside? That's the question. What is it? Now here is the answer. And that's why I'm directing your attention to it. Now, there is something, surely, which is truly astonishing about this. And especially when you take it in its context, coming immediately after we read about in chapter 2, the great day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost fell upon the church and all that followed, and this extraordinary incident of which I've reminded you, the healing of this lay man. Isn't it astonishing, I say, and amazing that anybody could have reacted to these events in the way that these people did? But, you know, that's still the case with all who are not Christian. It's the case in the trouble with all who still do, do not believe. Isn't there something, I say, almost incredible about it? But it happened. It happened. It is history. Uh, but, of course, we ought to realize that in another sense, it's not astonishing at all. For what happened here to these apostles, these disciples, was uh, simply a repetition of the same thing that had happened to our blessed Lord himself. You read the four Gospels, and there you'll find this same astonishing and almost incredible thing. You look at the Son of God, you see what he did, you, see, you hear what he said, and yet you see the antipathy that he aroused, the opposition, the bitterness, the rejection, and it ended in this, that the leaders and the crowd of the people joined in crying out, away with him, crucify him, and they killed him. Now well, that, I say, is the amazing thing. They did that to the Lord, and he, as you noticed in that reading from John 15, he predicted and prophesied that that would be the lot of all his followers, and it did happen to them. It happened here at the very beginning. It happened to him. It happened to these first preachers and disciples. My dear friend, there's nothing new about unbelief. It's as old as the preaching of the gospel. This is the thing that's so fatuous about the modern men that he thinks that to reject the gospel is the hallmark of modernity. It's old, it's very ancient. The modern rejecter of the gospel is simply repeating what these men did here at Jerusalem to the apostles of old and what they had previously done to our blessed Lord and Savior. Why am, we, why am I calling attention to this? Well, I'm calling attention to it for this reason. The world doesn't realize that in rejecting Christ and this message, it is verifying his teaching. It's proving that he was right. This idea, you know, that we ought to be disappointed and sad because men don't believe this gospel, that we ought to feel that something's gone wrong. That is wrong altogether. Our Lord prophesied that this would take place. 
This idea that the gospel is a message that's going to appeal to men and to be commendable uh, to men of any age is all wrong. The natural man has always hated it and rejected it. But you see, as I say, in doing so, he doesn't realize that he's proving the gospel. He's verifying our Lord's prophecy and prediction. Oh, but this is the tragedy. And that's why I'm directing attention to it. The world doesn't realize that in rejecting this, it's rejecting the only thing that can save it. It's a hot Sunday night, my dear friends, and I'm as hot as you are. And I shall be here sweating in this pulpit. Why do I do it? I'll tell you why I'm doing it. Look at your world. Look at this world of ours. We've already had two world wars. And look at your international situation. What's the matter with the world? What's the matter with men? Is there nothing that can put things right? I say there's only one thing that can even touch the problems of the human race. It's this. But this is what they're rejecting. This is what they're militantly opposed to. This is what they're ridiculing. As the authorities did with these apostles in Jerusalem so long ago. The world doesn't realize it's refusing the only thing that can put it right, and it's as true of individuals. If you are in this congregation tonight in trouble, if there's trouble in your life, trouble in your experience, if you feel you've gone to pieces and your whole prospects have gone to pieces, if you feel that you've made a mess of life and that you're a failure, well, my dear friend, I urge you, listen to this with all your being. Pray God the Spirit to give you ability to listen with a still greater intensity. Here is something that can put you right. But you see, the authorities reject it. And the world thinks it's clever tonight in rejecting Christianity. This is the greatest tragedy in the world. The greatest tragedy is not the bomb. It's mankind's rejection of the gospel. Because if they only believed the gospel, there'd be no bombs. This is the supreme tragedy. And that is why I say I'm calling your attention to it. Why did they do this? Well, they did it as our Lord said more than once. You had one of them in the reading from John 15 tonight. He said, you remember, they hated me without a cause. No cause at all. Am I speaking to somebody who has blasphemed the name of Christ, dismissed Christianity? Why did you do it? The answer is they hated me without a cause. Or as he said, dying upon the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. My dear friends, it's in order to try to enlighten you with regard to this that I'm asking you to consider with me the case of these people at Jerusalem that persecuted these apostles, this first persecution in the long history of the Christian church. You see, there's an advantage in looking on objectively, isn't there? It helps us to see a situation. In other words, I'm simply trying to adopt tonight the method of old that was adopted by Nathan the prophet in the case of David. David had done a terrible thing, you remember, but he wasn't aware of it. So Nathan concocted a story. He concocted a story that repeated the very thing that David had done, only that he put it in a different way. He said, now I'd like you to give your judgment on this. And David, with righteous indignation, gave his judgment on the men who had done this terrible thing. And then Nathan looked at him and said, thou art the man. You've condemned yourself. You see, David could see it in the case of somebody else. He couldn't see the same thing in his own case. We're all like that. And that is why we should thank God for these historical details that we have in the Bible. You look on at these rulers in Jerusalem, and I trust that as you look at them with me tonight, you'll be amazed and astonished. But my friend, if you're not a Christian, you've been doing the same thing. God grant that as we look objectively at them in this story, in this picture we may see something of ourselves and this terrible nature, this tragic character of unbelief at all times and in all generations. Now, tonight, I'm only going to take one aspect of this. I hope, God willing, to go on with this for the next three Sunday nights. This is the most important statement, this. 
Here is the key to the problem of the modern man and his rejection of Christianity. The whole thing is here, analyzed before us. All I'm going to do tonight is to ask you to look at one aspect of it. It's this. Let's have a look together at what unbelief rejects. Here's the good starting point. We'll consider later why it rejects it, but let's just consider now what it is it rejects. This old world of ours that's in such terrible trouble tonight, which is so proud of itself in its rejection of Christianity. Let's have a look and see what it is rejecting. Let's see how ridiculous it is. Let's see how tragic it is that anybody should reject for a moment this amazing gospel which we have here set forth before us. Now, it seems to me that this uh, subdivides itself very naturally and almost inevitably into three main headings. The first thing that these rulers were rejecting was, of course, the messengers. The messengers. They laid hands on Peter and John and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now even tired. And then the next day we are told that they set them in the midst and they began to ask them questions and to cross-examine them. It was the persecution of the church and in particular of the apostles and in particular the two leading apostles, Peter and John the men through whom this incident had taken place. And the authorities persecute and reject the men, the messengers. You've got to start with this. It was Peter's preaching that led to the trouble. The crowd gathered and they all listened and they were amazed as Peter expounded the gospel to them. So the authorities are annoyed with the men and they reject them. But this is, this is extraordinary. And I want to show you how whoever is not a Christian, whoever rejects the Christian message, the Christian faith tonight, is incidentally rejecting these messengers throughout the ages and the centuries. Now, why, why do I emphasize this? Well, for this reason. We are told in the 13th verse that follows where I stopped. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. But you see, that's where the contradiction comes in. That's where the blindness of unbelief comes in. Why do they arrest them? Why do they put them into prison? Why don't they allow their own sense of marvel and of amazement to lead them on in clear, inevitable, logical thinking? But they didn't do that. And that's always the trouble with unbelief. It doesn't know how to think. It's prejudice, as I'm going to show in a subsequent sermon. But here it is. Look at it like this. Here is this extraordinary phenomenon. The lay men, the man who'd never walked in his life, walking, leaping, praising God. And these two men have apparently done it. And one of them has been preaching a most astonishing sermon. And here they are now, standing before them in the court. And yet they miss the whole point. These men, what are they? Well, they're just fishermen. Ordinary, unlearned, ignorant men. Nobodies. Nobody had ever heard of them until a few days back. Some of them may have heard of them for the last three years, having been followers of this Jesus of Nazareth. But who was he? In any case, he was only a carpenter. And these are ordinary, ignorant, unlearned, unlettered men. They've never been to any school. They've got no learning. They've got nothing. But yet here they are. They're the cause of the excitement. They're preaching the sermon. And they've done this thing to these men. What is this? But the whole thing is rejected. And that is, I say, one of the first amazing things always about unbelief. Why didn't they think the thing through? Why didn't they say what makes these men what they are? They are unlearned. They're ignorant men. 
they dressed, they were dressed as such, they were dressed as fishermen, it was obvious what they were, their speech was probably rough and rude, lacking in all the refinements and sophistication which counts so much with rulers and authorities and powers. It was obvious that that's what they were, and yet, why didn't they see and didn't they feel the authority and the boldness and the power? Why not? What is this? You see, this is what unbelief always rejects. It's all right to throw a man into prison, but that doesn't explain him. The thing they should have said to themselves is this, what has made these men such as they are? What is this? They felt, you see, the record tells us that they were conscious that there was a kind of power. They were aware of the power, and they felt and they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Why didn't they think it through? I said, why didn't they ask themselves, now what does this, what is this extraordinary thing? Uh, first of all, they're preaching. We are told in the record then, Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. And you know, when a man is filled with the Holy Ghost, people feel it. Even people who don't believe what the preacher's saying, they know that there's power there, they feel it. They feel a reality, they feel a strength, they feel a force, they feel something dealing with them. And these men undoubtedly felt it. They marveled, but they didn't think it through. What is this? What is this that enables these unlearned and ignorant men to preach in this way? Where do they get this understanding of the scriptures from? Where do they get this power and ability to expound and to explain? What is this? Where do they get this conviction? It was a well-known fact that on the day of Pentecost, as the result of that first sermon preached by the Apostle Peter, that 3,000 people were converted and added to the church. Now, they didn't do that, you know, in those days by calling people to come forward at the end uh, that was unheard of at that time. It just happened that 3,000 people were rarely changed and everybody became aware of it. It was not a safe thing to do to become a Christian in those days. You'd be persecuted. You might be turned out of your home and house. You'd have your name taken out of the family Bible. The Jews, they hated this. But 3,000 were converted and joined the church and continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayer. And they were daily with one another, living for this thing. And indeed we are told here that by now, the number of the men came to be about 5,000. 3,000, day of Pentecost, since then 2,000 added as the result of Peter's sermon there in the temple porch by the side of the men who'd been healed. 5,000 people. Why didn't these authorities look at this and ask certain questions? Why didn't they say to themselves, what is this that enables these unlearned and ignorant men to speak in such a way that 5,000 people are completely changed and get a new life and a new understanding and are filled with joy and rejoicing, praising God and having favor with all the people? What is this? But you see, they didn't do that. Throw them into prison. Ah, I want to show you that this is what has been happening throughout the running centuries. And then, why didn't they put the same questions with regard to the miracle? The miracle is a fact. They couldn't get away from it. We are told in the 14th verse, beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. If they could have, they would have. If they could have explained away that miracle, they would have done it, but they couldn't do it. The man was standing. There's the evidence. There's the fact. Well, then I say it's no solution to throw the, the apostles into prison. For the fact is that it was through them that this thing had happened to this men. But you see, unbelief doesn't do that. Unbelief dismisses a thing. Nothing in Christianity. Play it out. Throw it into prison. Throw it out through the back door. There's the end of it. But it isn't, you know. You haven't explained it. You haven't answered it. You haven't given a reason for it. You get rid of the messengers, but you don't get rid of the facts. You don't get rid of the truth. Now, here is something then that I want to try to show you. That men and women are as guilty of tonight as were these rulers in Jerusalem so long ago. 
It's the clever thing to dismiss Christianity, isn't it? Say what? People still believe that. In 1965, incredible. What, with all our modern knowledge and science and learning? St still be the thing is ridiculous. Nobody of any intelligence or learning any longer believes that kind of thing. All are dismissed like that. Throw them into prison. Get rid of the witnesses. Get rid of the messengers. Oh, but my dear friend, don't you realize what you're doing in dismissing Christianity as you try to do with the wave of the end? What you are really doing is you're trying to dismiss the greatest men, the noblest souls that this world has ever known. You're not only dismissing these apostles. Who are you dismissing? You are dismissing the martyrs and the confessors. You're dismissing many of those early witnesses in the first three centuries who laid down their lives for this gospel. You're dismissing these people who were able to turn that ancient world upside down, who were so, so able to shake even the Roman Empire that it became politic for an emperor to become a Christian and to bring his empire in with him. That's what you're dismissing. Have you ever tried to analyze it? Here they are, ignorant and unlearned men, just a handful of people in the great Roman Empire with Greece and their philosophy against and Rome against and the Jews against. What is it that turns this ignorant handful of people into such a mighty power that it turns that Roman Empire upside down and becomes the leading power in the life of men? Can you dismiss it as easily as that? But that's what men do in their ignorance. You're dismissing, I say, the apostles, the martyrs, and the confessors. And think of some of the individuals you're dismissing. Think of that mighty man, St. Augustine of Hippo. I mention him were it for no other reason than this. The great problem confronting the thinkers of today is the problem of history, the problem of time, the problem of what's happening to the whole universe. Well, I suppose the single greatest treatise ever written on that subject was Augustine's The City of God. Way back all those long centuries ago, this man saw it all and he wrote it and there it is, it's remained throughout the running centuries. And when you dismiss Christianity, you're dismissing a man like that, one of the profoundest philosophers the world has ever known, a man who had a deeper insight perhaps into this whole problem of history and its meaning than any other single individual has ever had. Here was a man who was a pagan philosopher, but who became a Christian, was converted by this same power of the Holy Spirit, came to believe in this same Jesus, was revolutionized, and was given this understanding to produce that masterpiece. I'm simply reminding you that when you, like these authorities of old, think you can dismiss Christianity by a wave of the hand, you're dismissing a man like that. It's interesting to notice how modern thinkers are turning back to him and are increasingly ready to listen to him. They're republishing his works. Though he lived as way, far away back as the 4th century. And then, oh, I could go on telling you I could keep you the rest of the night giving you a list of these men whom you're rejecting, you're dismissing a mighty man like Martin Luther. One man who can stand up against 15 centuries of history and cause a change, a new turning point. You're dismissing the gigantic intellect of John Calvin, the men, the quarter centenary of whose death we were commemorating last year, 1964. One of these great architectonic minds that seems to span truth, as it were, under the illumination of the spirit and opens out vistas of thought that go on stretching endlessly into the future. That's the sort of person you're dismissing. And another great man I'd like to mention is a man like Oliver Cromwell. I've been reading again about him recently. 
that the men who laid the foundations of the greatness of this country let us never forget. And he was what he was because he was a Christian. And you're dismissing him. You're saying there's nothing in it. And all the rest of them, the men who followed this mighty succession of men and women who figured in the Christian church, who've been saints and martyrs and apologists and confessors, they're all, the messengers are all dismissed as non-entities. Shall I sum this up before I turn away from it? By putting it in the form of an anecdote that one of my predecessors in this pulpit was so fond of telling, I'm referring to the Reverend Dr. John A. Hutton. I often heard him say this. He said he once had a professor when he was a student who, when he was confronted by a class or an audience of people who didn't believe the gospel, because of their great intellects. He said the old professor generally used to preface his remarks in some such words as these. Gentlemen, I want to suggest to you that a gospel and a teaching which uh, produced a Paul and an Augustine and a Luther and a Calvin and a Knox and the great Puritans and Oliver Cromwell and Whitfield and Wesley and Gladstone and Newman and the rest. I suggest to you, gentlemen, he used to say, that the gospel is at any rate worthy of your respectful consideration. And I would say the same tonight. If you reject the gospel, you're rejecting these giants that have, or that have been as ornaments in not only the life of the church, but in the life of the whole world. Here they are, you see. They throw the apostles into prison. They reject the messengers. But come, let us hurry on. Having rejected the messengers, they at the same time, of course, reject the message. And what a message they reject. What is this Christian message? What is this gospel? Well, I can only put it before you in bold terms tonight in this introductory sermon of mine. But Peter sums it all up for us. He says, if you want to know what's happened, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, Even by him that doth this man stand here before you whole. Indeed, we'd already been told earlier that these people were grieved, that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, here it is, isn't it? This is the great thing. Watch the modern men rejecting. What's he dismissing with scorn and contumely? What is he suggesting is really almost an insult to the modern educated men. What is it? Well, it's uh, this extraordinary message concerning this person here described as Jesus Christ of Nazareth. But I I, I thought, says somebody, that uh, Christianity was uh, a question as to who Cain's wife was. And what was that strange animal that smaller swallowed Jonah? But it isn't, you know. That isn't, that isn't the question. That isn't Christianity. It isn't the essence of Christianity. That's one of the questions that you bring up, oh, I suppose, in a year's time when we've gone on doing this every Sunday night. Not until you don't start there. That's one of the peripheral things. But you see, that's the clever thing people do, isn't it? Christianity, nothing in it. Science, disproved it. Nothing in it at all. Of course, absolutely ridiculous. Who's Cain's what? So, uh, the, the whole thing's gone. On we go, on with the dance, on with the war, on with the bombs, on with hell. No, no, my dear friend. Isn't it about time the world began to consider this message? What is it? Oh, it's about Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What's the message? Well, it's this. That into this old, sinful, unhappy world of ours, 
A babe was once born to whom they give the na- gave the name of Jesus. Where was he born? Well, he was born in a little city called Bethlehem. Where was he born there? Born in a stable. Why was he born in a stable? We are told because there was no room for them in the inn. His mother had to go up there with the others because there was a census. She was on the verge of giving birth to her firstborn child, a pregnant woman. But there was no room in the inn. All the rooms in the inn had been booked and in all the other inns. And nobody was going to go out to make room for her. Why should they? They'd booked months ago. Every man for himself. I'm all right, Jack. What's it matter whether the woman is pregnant? This is my room. I've booked it. You see, the world has always been like that. It's like that tonight. It was like that then. So this child was born in a stable in a, amidst the straw and the lowing of the cattle. And they had to put his little body into a manger. What is this? Who is this? What's all this, you say? The world's in trouble. I'm concerned about the possibility of a war over what's happening in Vietnam. All right, my friend, I am too. That's why I'm preaching to you. And I tell you that there is no more relevant fact for you to know at this moment than just this, that that babe was born in Bethlehem. Who is he? He is the Son of God. That's the only hope in this world tonight, that God is concerned about this world. And he sent his son into it. That's what these men were preaching. This is what the authorities were rejecting. This person, Jesus of Nazareth, born in poverty and in lowliness. This young man who worked with his hands as a carpenter for some 18 years or so. And then suddenly set out in his public ministry. What did he preach? Well, you see, this is to me the extraordinary thing about unbelief. What was his teaching? Well, his teaching was what you can find, for instance, in the Sermon on the Mount. Isn't this the very thing the world needs tonight? Love your enemies, do good to them that hate you, bless them that persecute you and treat you in a malign manner and use you despitefully. My friend, did you know this? If only every man and woman in the world tonight lived the Sermon on the Mount, all our problems would be solved. Every one of them. This is his message. This is his way of life. He preached it. He commended it. He practiced it. He gave them an illustration of it. And he pleaded with people to live it. They reject that. That's what you're rejecting. You're rejecting a teaching that condemns adultery and murder and malice and spite and hatred. You are rejecting a teaching that commends love and mercy and compassion and kindness and mutual regard and help. That's what you're rejecting. They reject them. They rejected him. They said, away with him, crucify him. They're throwing his apostles into prison. This is the message they're rejecting. This is the teaching that they're throwing on board. What's the matter with it, I ask you? It's the very thing the world stands most in need of. They're rejecting his miracles. They're rejecting one who was a friend of publicans and sinners. He wasn't like the Pharisees, you know. If he'd been like the Pharisees, I could understand people rejecting him. The Pharisee was a very proud man and a very self-righteous man. The Pharisee said that he'd never sinned. He was a good man. He gave a tenth of his goods to the poor. He fasted twice in the week. He'd never committed adultery. He'd never committed murder. He was a paragon of all the virtues. And when he saw a publican, he drew his skirts up and he kept as far away as he could. He felt the man was a leper. That's the Pharisee. But our Lord was the exact opposite. He condemned the Pharisees. He was a friend of publicans and sinners. 
He sat down with them. He spoke to them. He ate and drank with them. He sympathized with them. He defended them against these wretched Pharisees who were always condemning them. But that's the one they reject. And the message the world is rejecting is the message about this kind of person. And then all his miracles and his kindly deeds, his eye for suffering, his eye of compassion and mercy. He never missed the case when the disciples even sometimes were annoyed with him. He insisted upon stopping. There was somebody in need and he couldn't pass. That's the one they're rejecting. This is the message. Jesus Christ. Oh, have you ever really looked at him? You've used his name as an oath, perhaps. I'm asking, have you ever looked at the portraits of him in the four Gospels? Have you ever really stood and contemplated him? Do it, my friend. This is the one you're rejecting and the message concerning him. But wait a minute. There he is upon a cross, nailed to a cross. He's been arrested. What for? Nobody could bring a charge against him. Nobody. They tried to trump up some case. They tried to concoct a charge. It wouldn't hold water for a second. There was no witness. There was nothing. He'd done nothing wrong. Nobody could bring a charge against him. But they condemned him, and there they've led him up a little hill called Golgotha. They tried to make him carry his cross for a while, but it was too heavy for him. And he was staggering under it, and somebody had to take his place and relieve him. But at last they reach the little hill and there they nail him to a tree and in agony and suffering he dies. That's the message. The one who'd never done any harm and the one who always had done good and the one who taught and preached in the manner that I've indicated to you. He dies upon a tree in a most shameful manner conceivable, in indescribable agony and suffering. And after he dies, they take down the body and they put it in a grave and roll a stone over it and put a seal to that and put some soldiers to guard it. But you know, that isn't the end of the story. The man would still be sitting helpless on the pavement outside the beautiful gate if the story had ended there. And Peter would never have been able to preach as he did. No, no, this Jesus, what happens? Oh, he bursts us under the bands of death. He rises from the grave. Jesus and the resurrection. This is a fact, you know. There would never have been an apostle but for this. There would never have been a Christian church at all but for this. We are even told by these honest records that his own followers completely lost hope when they saw him dying. They were utterly disconsolate. They thought the end had come. If he'd not risen from the dead, there would never have been anything. But he did. He arose, he manifested himself unto them, he gave them a commission, he ascended into heaven in their presence, and he sent down the Holy Ghost upon them on the day of Pentecost as he'd promised. And so, miracles happen, and they're able to preach with power and with spirit as they do. That's the message. That's what you are rejecting, said Peter, to these people. That's what you seem to be unaware of. You know, we are nobodies. We are unlearned and ignorant men. We've got nothing to say for ourselves. We've got nothing to say in and on ourselves. We are just witnesses of these things. I'm simply reporting facts to you. There he is. That's what you're rejecting. And what is the meaning of all this? This is the vital part of the message, you see. Oh, it's this. It's all here on this communion table, broken bread, poured out wine. What's it mean? It means this. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. God hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Listen, my dear friend, listen to this. This is what it all means. The great, eternal, everlasting God who made the whole universe and made men in his own image. The God who owns everything. The God who's over everything. The God who's going to judge everything. The God against whom mankind has rebelled and ascended. 
And as a result, it's brought down misery and unhappiness and shame upon itself. Oh, dear friend, realize this. You know, there's nothing in the world tonight as it originally was in God's creation. God didn't make a world like this tonight. God made men upright and perfect. He made a woman a helpmeet for him, equally upright and perfect. There was no sin in Adam and Eve. There was no lust. There was no evil desire. There was no hatred, malice, spite. There was nothing ugly or unclean. They were perfect and righteous before God. Where have we all come from? Oh, we are the result of their rebellion against God. And think of all the unhappiness in the world tonight. All the misery and the heartache. The broken marriages, the broken homes. Little children breaking their hearts. Seeing father and mother separating. Oh, the agony of life as the result of sin and evil. And men totally incapable of doing anything about it. All your education can't deal with it. All your politicians can't put it right. Do you know what this message is that the world is rejecting tonight? It's this. That the everlasting and eternal God against whom we've all rebelled and against whom we've all sinned, in spite of our sins, still loves the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It was when the fullness of the times had come that God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that are under the law. It's God who sent him to Bethlehem. It's God who sent him into the world. It's God who sent him to the cross. It is God who laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's God who's taken your sins and put them on him and punished them in him and is offering you a free pardon tonight. It's God who's done it. That's what Peter and John were preaching. That was the message that was being rejected. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. My dear friend, isn't this the tragedy of the world? Men and women interested in romance, ready to believe any novel, ready to believe any film, getting excited about mere imagination which isn't true to life. And in the meantime, rejecting the fact of Christ, the incarnation, God visiting and redeeming his people, the glory of the cross, the way of salvation and reconciliation to God, life and immortality brought to light through the gospel, Jesus Christ, the vanquisher of all the enemies of men, the devil and sin and evil and even death, the last enemy, he's conquered. Jesus and the resurrection. Oh, is there anything more tragic than unbelief that not only rejects the messengers but also rejects such a message? And shall I just mention a third and a last point to you? Unbelief not only rejects the messenger and the message, it rejects the results of the message. Do you notice how Peter puts it in verse 9? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, You rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of what? The good deed, the good deed done to the impotent man. Now this I say is the most astonishing and amazing thing of all. You've thrown us into prison, said Peter. You've got us here on trial now. What are you trying us about? Why are we here? Why were we arrested? Why did we spend last night in prison? Why are we now standing in the court? What have we done? Have we got drunk? Have we committed murder? Have we been blasphemers? Have we turned the place upside down? Have we wrought havoc in Jerusalem? No, we haven't. 
We are on trial because of a good deed that we've done. Can't you see unbelief, my friend? What it rejects is a good deed. What we are told about our Lord by Peter later on in the house of Cornelius is this, that he went about doing good. The crowd said, away with him, crucify him. What has he done? The answer is, he's done nothing but good. The world has never seen and will never see such a benefactor. He lived to do good. He relieved suffering and trouble. He was compassionate. He was sympathetic. There was nothing that he wouldn't do for people who were in need and who looked to him. And yet they crucified him. Good deed. And that is the astonishing thing about unbelief. Peter and John are in prison and are on trial because they've enabled a man who was born lame to rise, to stand, to walk, to leap, to praise God. Good deed. And this is but a faint picture of all the blessings that our blessed Lord and Savior has brought into this world of time. And this is where the world is showing its madness this evening. John the Baptist that got into trouble was beginning to doubt and he sent his two emissaries to Christ saying, Art thou he that should come or do we look for another? You remember the answer our Lord sent back? Go back and tell John again the things that you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf are made to hear, the dead are raised, and unto the poor the gospel is preached. Good deeds. And it was for that that they rejected him. But oh, all that I say is but a picture of the blessings that come to all who believe this blessed gospel of the glorious God, the blessings in the Christian life. What are you rejecting? Let me tell you, you're rejecting rest of mind. He stands here tonight saying, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest. In the useless quest for truth. Rest. In all your intellectual perplexity, he'll give you rest. Rest. In your endeavor and attempt to be righteous and holy and clean and pure. And all your failures. Rest in the search for God. Rest in all your difficulties. Or let me put it in terms of light. He said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. These are the good deeds. These are the things that he's come to do and to bring. He gives light. Light on God. Light on myself. Light on the world. Light on the way to be reconciled to God. Oh, but above rest and light he gives me life. And this is the thing we stand in need of above everything else. My dear friend, did you realize that in rejecting this gospel like these rulers did of old in Jerusalem, what you are really rejecting is forgiveness of sins. Do you know that in Jesus Christ, the Son of God tonight, you are offered free pardon and forgiveness? You may have sinned to the very gate of hell. doesn't matter. If you repent and believe this great message now, you'll be forgiven immediately. You won't have to do anything. You just believe. Simply believe. Only believe. And thou shalt see that Christ is all in all to thee. Repent. That's all you've got to do. This is what the world is rejecting. Man's got an uneasy conscience. He's afraid of life. He's afraid of death. He's afraid of eternity. And very, very rightly is he afraid of them. Because we've all got to die and stand before God in judgment. That's why these people didn't like the message of the resurrection. He preached that through Christ there is a resurrection for all men. And they saw it and they didn't like it. But it's true. Ah, uh, yes. But you see, the moment you see that and are terrified, here comes the blessed message that your sins can be blotted out, freely forgiven. 
Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though you've sinned yourself into the depths and the dregs and the gutters of existence, you believe on the Son of God and your sins will be blotted out like a thick cloud and you'll be reconciled to God. Not only that, you will be given a new life immediately. You'll have a new start. Here's a gospel that can say this. It's the gospel of the prodigal son. It's a gospel of rebirth, regeneration, renewal, making men anew. It's true. Here it is. And when men and women reject this message, this gospel, they're rejecting all that. Not only the forgiveness and the reconciliation, new life, new power, new start, new everything. Listen to Paul putting it to the Corinthians. Here it is. Here's a word for the modern world in which we live. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. They were that, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Here is a gospel which is the power of God unto salvation that can cleanse and wash and renew a man and make him a saint in the kingdom of God and give him an everlasting hope to look forward to. That's what men reject when they reject the gospel. If you want to know, says Peter, about the good deed that was done to the impotent men, here's the explanation. And my beloved friend, if you've rejected this gospel, you've rejected all that. Your only hope of heaven and eternity, your only hope of forgiveness, peace of conscience, peace of mind, peace of heart, tranquility, new life, new power, new vigor, new strength. Go back to the same old world and where you always went down you'll stand and you'll walk and you'll leap and you'll praise God. That's what the world is rejecting. All the greatest benefits that mankind has ever known have come through this gospel. Good deeds. Where did your hospitals come from? Christian church. Where did education come from? Christian church. Where did relief of the poor and the suffering from come from? Christian church. Look at the missionary activities. Look at the light that has been taken to the dark places of the earth. Where did you get your liberty from? Magna Carta. Yes, but you know, that didn't do very much according to the best history of today. Do you know where our modern liberty has really come from? I can tell you. It came through the Puritans of the 17th century, Oliver Cromwell and the rest. Where did the United States come from? From the same place, the Pilgrim, the Puritan Fathers. Liberty! Liberty of worship! Liberty to do what you want in these senses! It's all come from this! The modern man talks about his liberties. Do you know that your trade unions were a direct outcome of the evangelical revival of 200 years ago? These are some of the good deeds that have been done by this message and by its preachers, its messengers. Where has your morality come from? Where have your noblest periods in the history of this country come from? And the answer is they've always come in the wake of religious revivals. And as the modern world in its cleverness is turning its back upon this message and its messengers, it is hurtling itself back into what two modern writers have called rightly the cult of softness. 
and all the immorality and the vice and the dishonesty of life increasing in this country today. These are the opposite of the good deeds. But men reject this and they're rejecting the best, the noblest, the greatest things. I do trust that God the Spirit has been revealing you tonight as you've looked at these rulers in Jerusalem over 1900 years ago. I trust he's been revealing you yourself to you through them. See the folly of unbelief. See its blindness. See its tragedy. See its utter hopelessness. Did you know that you can go out of this service tonight forgiven? Oh, my dear friend. See the utter folly of unbelief. And repent. And believe the gospel and you begin to walk and you begin to leap. And you begin to praise the God who has done this good deed, this wonderful work to you. Through his blessed son, Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.